Hello everyone and welcome back to Spider-Man Dissemble. This is Michael T. Bradley. And this is Jason Freston. We're next going to look at Amazing Spider-Man 552 through 554. These issues are written by Bob Gale and penciled by Phil Jimenez. Again, Jimenez, Jimenez, don't know. Andy Lanning cannot ink Phil Jimenez to save his life, it seems, though he does get better as the issues go on. Yay, Jimenez! Although I totally agree, really not the right inker for his lines there. It doesn't ruin the art, but it drives drags it down just a little bit, but it's all right, Andy. The Legion and the Guardians more than make up for some thick uh, inks. I'm cool with that. This storyline marks the first appearance of the DB lead page to sum up what's gone before. We use a splash page from the front of the DB to uh, show everything that's going on currently plot-wise. We have some subplots that just keep going on in the background. Dexter Bennett doesn't know names and he's crazy. Um, May works at Feast, Ben and Pallone, etc., etc., etc. Freak will shoot up anything! <laughs> I still like how they're handling Councilman Hollister on this first issue, this arc here. I feel like they're trying to give you the impression that he is a stand-up guy, and it's really easy to turn that into a holier-than-thou attitude, which so far they've avoided, so I'm, I'm happy with that. Oh, again, we have clever bits that aren't really funny, but are quite clever. We see someone, uh, the splash page of the first issue is the uh, DB editorial room the, where, you know, people are writing stories, etc. And somebody is telling someone who's writing on a, a computer screen, it's whacker, not whack her. And then at the top of the page, you see that in the credits, uh, Whacker, the editor, is listed as Whack Her. thought this was a clever little bit. Again, it's not funny, but it's, it's a very, very clever little bit, making it feel as if they're playing around with you in an editorial fashion in, in a way that they did in the old days. And it, it feels fun, I guess. All right, so there does seem to be a lot of editorial jokes towards the reader, which, you know, is fun in its own way. I, I'm not convinced I, I like it too much of it, and it really personally starts to break the immersion. Um, so far they haven't hit that mark, I'm just kind of throwing it out there. Alright, now, I was really interested in what Stan was going to tell Aunt May, but Stupid Freak totally ruined that for me by stealing the cash box. I just wish he would go snort something. It's all he's good for. I thought the link between Freak, uh, Freak the creature being born out of Freak the person because of stuff that Kurt Connors was working on, I thought that was nice because he doesn't just turn out to be a lizard clone, but he turns out to be something new and it's because of something from Spider-Man's past. I thought that worked well, though it didn't need all that buildup. Okay, I have to admit, the visuals of Freak being attacked by his own vomit were pretty awesome. And something about that very last panel on that page reminded me a lot of the old Valiant art style. I don't know why, but it just did. We have for, I believe, the first time Bobby Carr is mentioned at a party that uh, Harry's throwing, I think it is, for the, uh, the mayoral thing. I think that's what it's for. Bobby Carr gets mentioned. He will become important later. OMG! Overuse of acronyms at the party! LOL! Is there something going on between Carly and Pete? She's definitely a little flirty with him here. And uh, I think I said Charlie in earlier episodes. It's Carly. Carly is the forensics chick. So also at the party, there's a couple of more editorial jokes. Though Pete's hand is in the way, it's not too hard to tell that the first pledge is by a T. Graybort there, Amazing Spider-Man's executive editor. For the cheapskate, he is a five whole dollars. And the second one seems to be D. Buckley, which is Marvel's publisher. He's going in for a whopping 35. So basically, Pete was willing to donate more money to this campaign than either of those two yahoos. And apparently I've also been saying it wrong. It's Vin and O'Neill. Pallone is the detective working on the Spidey Tracer killing case. Vin and O'Neill are the ones who, uh, Vin doesn't really like Spider-Man. O'Neill's like, you just need to be around a bit longer, kid. He's really on our side. Although the other thing we find out about O'Neill this issue is that he's somewhat trigger happy. He just like blasts Freak away the second he sees him. Okay, now wow, I really like the idea of the NYPD using Spidey as some type of scapegoat for when they mess up on paperwork or something gets trashed or kicking down a door or whatever. You know, that is nicely played. I really like that idea. Issue two has this awesome two page spread with each row mirroring the other. It's like we follow along this row that goes two pages uh, three different characters and each panel mirrors the one above it. It's just really gorgeously done. I don't know if that was Gale doing that or if that was Jimenez's idea, but either way, it is gorgeous. <laughs> All right, so on to the second issue here. The entire point of OMD was to make Spidey more accessible to, to younger single readers and they make an ET joke and a Sesame Street joke. 
Woo, their fingers are on the pulse of the youth, I'm telling you, totally on the pulse. Carly has now gone apparently from forensic assistant who's really happy to get to work on an actual murder case to Quincy MD because she's just everywhere doing everything now. We really get that whole hard luck hero theme pounded down some more here because, uh, for instance, Lily's dad is running for mayor and Peter has to take negative photos of him to get a bonus. Also, while not quite the central theme of the hard luck stuff, I, I do like how it's acknowledged that, you know, you can just take some simple photos out of context, throw them on, you know, a newspaper and make a smear campaign. We also really start to see Bennett being a complete jerk here for the first time as opposed to just being some wacky old man that doesn't remember names. I mean, it's like you see there's a kind of a really nasty hardness to what he's wanting to do there. There's some hijinks with Pete doing his laundry that just falls incredibly flat. It's like him trying to get a neighbor to stop spying on him, etc, etc, and it's just so not funny, and it's painfully not funny. Yeah, I totally concur with the hard luck stuff not being funny. The pants ripping and him getting splashed with water in that first issue did absolutely nothing for me. Apparently JJJ has some really bad doctors, because one of his doctors says something about, like, you let him see that and he'll have another stroke. I thought he had a heart attack. You would think the doctor would know that. Unless he had a stroke after the heart attack and we just didn't see that. While I love the idea of them not telling Jonah that the bugle was sold, the joke about comic books, that's just, they're, they still print that trash, you know, fell really flat for me. I'm guessing maybe that's just uh, Jameson's kick the dog moment. We know he's a jerk because he's just insulted us. I, I don't get it, but yeah. Freak attacks Crown! Crown is the other mayoral candidate. Lily's dad is kind of getting into the race right now. At this point, Crown is running unopposed. The, the mayoral race continues to be a, a big subplot. I don't know if it's just me, but um, especially in here where like Freak kind of comes up out of the sewer and he's played all, uh, uh, not exactly a victim, but kind of pathetically, I felt like there was a lot of uh, intentional allusions to Vermin, the character Vermin. Freak, it very much feels like they're kind of trying to do their own version of Vermin. Holy crap, Freak just snorted Spider-Man's pants. All right, now that is probably the funniest thing so far in this whole story arc, and I totally don't even think it was intentional. There's a lot of, I think, unnecessary setup with this meth lab that's going on for this whole, like, to set up the Act 3. Like, you know, rather than just, I don't know, <laughs> one panel of Pete being like, huh, smells like drugs in here. Oh, no, it's flammable. Instead, it's like this, like, five or six pages in Issue 2 to set up exactly why the flames are going to happen in Issue 3 and the meth lab and these characters who we're never going to see again, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Very odd. I like that our meth dealers are a multicultural bunch. So Spidey saves Crown from Freak's attack, and of course Crown blames him. We get one of uh, Spidey's best lines so far, I think. I, I did overall enjoy the kind of chase scene and, and stuff with Jackpot in general from uh, the last storyline, but I love this line. That closes down this meth lab. What will young Wall Street do now? Okay, so far, aside from the Wall Street crack, because Michael was totally right, that was that was pretty funny. The only other lines that I've, I've seen so far during the story arc that I, I thought's been good and chuckle-worthy is the boys got nice legs, though, from the woman at the DB and then this random guy at the hospital. But, Oh, that was funny. We get Freak versus Spidey in an inferno! Really, after everything that Spider-Man's seen, uh, watching a monster smoke crack, like, totally surprises him to the point that Freak gets the jump on him? Uh, wow, Spider-Sense sucks! We get more Betty, which is awesome. I love Betty. I think she's a great supporting character and I want to see more of her. Spidey gets $2,000, which of course he goes and uses on web shooters. We see that be a, a big kind of subplot here is the fact that his web shooters aren't working. Oh, now uh, Jameson had a heart attack again, so I guess he got a better doctor. Hey, more fun continuity stuff. Uh, during the scene with JJJ in the hospital, the DB reports a blizzard on the way. Yep, during the next story arc. I, I like that. That is that is one good bonus about having this whole brain trust thing going on, I think. A lot of times in ongoing serialized fiction, you're going to have people take the idiot ball. Peter really just takes it and runs with it here. It's like he's playing idiot kickball or something because he decides to go see JJJ as Spider-Man and apologize. Why he thinks this would be a good idea, I don't know. It, it It's not conveyed very well in the uh, thought balloons. It doesn't make any sense. It seems ridiculous ridiculous and somewhat mean-spirited. Though I thought, much like how in Civil War there was a big missed opportunity to show Peter apologizing to Jameson before he unmasked, because I really, really think that he should have, I think this was a missed opportunity as well, because I think it would be great if you kind of like played it up so that it's like, oh, this is going to end badly, and then it just kind of like turned into them being like two sad men haunted by their pasts. 
I think that would have been awesome, like really, really interesting and a different way to go with Jameson, but instead we just see the typical stuff. We see Lily here kind of flirting with Pete, maybe hitting on him. I gotta say, I really like the idea of, you know, Pete being lucky with the ladies. I've always liked that. I've always enjoyed that aspect about Pete, that he's kind of dorky, yet somehow something about him is attracted to the ladies. You know, I mean, we kind of take it as read that it's the fact that he's this noble hero character underneath, so they can kind of sense that spine or what have you. But it, it's just been an ongoing uh, uh, running gag, at least it was for a long, long time. Gag isn't really the right word, because it was never meant to be super funny. It was just kind of like, an interesting little quirk about Peter that I liked, and we didn't see that so much after he gets married, which is fine. I mean, that makes sense, but I, I really like that, and I like that they're playing off of it, but with Lily, it just seems to me like she's daddy's little girl. Like, she would be willing to do anything for dad, which is why with this and uh, possibly the next storyline, I'm really starting to, to, to suspect that she is menace, which uh, seems ridiculous, but I don't know. I think it fits. So the other thing about Lily hitting on Pete in this scene, the Rainbow Room, is she's doing it right, literally right in front of Harry. I mean, they are right there. And Harry's just like, it's cool, I'm a millionaire and crap. Uh, right, I'm fine with that. Pete gets away to slow Freak down, but Freak's gone! To be continued! Do -do -do -do. All right, so it's kind of interesting how at the end of this first part of the story arc, Pete seems to be totally back to enjoying Spider-Man again. With the free comic book day issue, he was looking forward to hanging up his webs, living a normal life and whatnot, and now he's just like, wow, getting shot at by the police is way better than doing laundry, woo! I can't blame him for thinking that. I hate laundry, but it just seems to be a rather fast turnaround to me. I'm going to actually kind of break the format a little bit and skip ahead to Amazing Spider-Man 558 because it's a one-off issue that kind of wraps up the freak stuff here. It feels a little odd because essentially this is a four-part story with a break in between, but that's okay. I mean, you know, I, I like the fact that they're playing it out this way and that life doesn't actually happen one, two, three, four all the time. This one's by Bob Gale and Barry Kitson, who's awesome, as usual. Yeah, Kitson. Love Barry Kitson, too. One thing I will say about the Brand New Day stuff is they have been overall so far pretty much kicking butt with the artists. So, yay. And Mark Farmer doing the inks. So that's even like a double bonus there. Spidey unmasked! Or not. It's a nightmare. Gale seems to love teasing this aspect. He did it on a cover for the uh, Freak 3-parter, and now he did it again, like, first, second page here. Like, I, I don't know if it's them trying to say that subconsciously Peter is haunted by the fact that he did unmask publicly. Well, I guess it wouldn't even be subconsciously, because supposedly, I don't know if we know this or not at this point yet, but I guess he really did unmask. So maybe he's still got nightmares about it because of that. Who knows? We get a little bit of Jameson and his wife subplot, which, thank God, this bit humanizes Jameson in a way that's totally believable because we see him get angry and upset, and then at the last moment he pulls back because he sees that she really loves him and she cares for him, and that's the whole reason that she's hurt him. And I just I just think that moment is beautiful, really well done. I don't know if it would have any meaning for, for instance, new readers who don't have that resonance, who probably just by now only hate Jameson. So there's this quick little scene with Peter and Aunt May, and, you know, overall I kind of liked it because it's, it's him being like, I want to go and leave, you know, and I just, you know, I don't want to leave you by yourself because you're all sad and whatnot. And I mean, it's... <sighs> I know it's pretty predictable that she's happy, you know? I mean, that seems to be the obvious kind of gag for that. But at the same time, I feel like it's probably one of the biggest pieces of personalization that they've given me since Brand New Day started up. So it's like, hey, wow, that was nice. There's a little bit of smidgen, teeny bit of characterization there, and it, that made me happy. So Feast is supporting Hollister, which is Lily's dad. And this is bad because I guess that was an important thing to have. Crown puts Lynn on, or Mr. Lynn on the list, which seems very ominous, and I think because Gail probably thought it's going to be really obvious that people are going to think that he's Menace or something, they kind of show us immediately Menace attacking Hollister, and Crown basically being like, oh, this Menace guy, he's crazy or whatever. So we know that Crown himself is not related to Menace, which is again another reason why I think it works that Lily is Menace. I don't know, I could be totally off, and probably most of you out there reading already know, I'm sure Menace gets unmasked before too, too long, but that's my guess at this point. Okay, so when Menace attacks Hollister there, I, I really like how O'Neill is like, you know, hold your fire, fire, Vin, we, he's too low, we might hit somebody, when, you know, O'Neill had no problem shooting a freak while he's in the middle of a crowd, you know, it's just like, I don't care. 
Then we get this whole climax where uh, Freak is put in quicklime in the junkyard and it's a big fight and Kurt Connors helps Spidey get Freak and uh, I mean it's nothing horrible, nothing great, it just it happens and it's over and thank goodness Freak gets taken to an Oscorp facility. And I'm totally sure that Freak will find the help he needs at Oscorp. I mean we, we all do, Oscorp is where it's at. The art is, as usual, beautiful. Peter looks a little off here to me, but um, he looks consistent, and I like the look, so I'm okay with the fact that it doesn't really jibe with my inner vision of Peter. So even though the organic web shooter kind of question comes up a lot in this issue, or these issues, I think we're going to wait till next time to discuss them. Bob Gale is sadly, I think, so far the weakest writer out of the four on the Brain Trust, which is shocking to me and uh, frustrating. But I got to say, he does do quite a few subplots. He keeps the plates spinning quite a bit in his issues, which, you know, in, in his manifesto, one of the things Brave War talks about is the uh, modular subplots. So I would be a little bit frustrated to find out that the subplots that I like in Gale's stuff might not necessarily be his writing. But we don't even know for certain if those, that modular subplot idea carried through. But I assume it does, like the Jameson stuff, anything with and Feast, etc, etc, feels like it's those modular subplots being slotted in. Much like, for instance, I'm sure that we have Harry here in this panel, whoever was writing the storyline in the next trade, because, you know, as of right now, I have read, like, two trades ahead still. In the next trade, there's a storyline where Mary Jane comes back and she's dating Bobby Carr, and I'm sure whoever was writing that was like, hey, can you put in a mention of Bobby Carr in this page somewhere? And they were like, sure, and, and it all dovetailed. It works quite nicely, I think. I will agree that Bob Gale has been the, the weakest of the writers so far, but honestly, I'm, I'm kind of still surprised in general at the, the quality overall of, of Brand New Day. He is the weakest, but he doesn't suck. I mean, I've read way worse stories by different people than, than these. You know, I mean, I think, I think a lot of uh, Gale's weakest bits during this, aside from the humor, which really nobody's been able to get, you know, with the, the Brand New Day stuff at all, really. So aside from that, I think kind of his weaker stuff is things that I at least found irritating were things like, I need my China white, you know, and all of these like just kind of like drug references that honest to goodness street druggy would not use, you know, I mean, it just it felt very unnatural and very wooden, a lot of freaks dialogue. And then, of course, like I said, the humor just kind of falling flat. But, I, but the basic pacing of the story, like Michael said, being able to keep the uh, plate spinning, I think was, was solid, you know, I mean, it's, it's weaker, but they were still solid, I felt. One of the kind of weird things about the story arc overall, I felt, was that the freak arc really felt kind of like a filler plot. I mean, like, the A plot felt very filler, but all of the subplots felt, you know, very necessary. And, I mean, it's like, I really had a lot more fun with the Hollister campaigning plots and the Bennett being a jerk plots and the, you know, JJJ having his, what is it, is an aneurysm now? What, why, aneurysm? I, I, whatever it is that he's having, stroke, aneurysm, heart attack, whatever. You know, I've been having a lot more fun with those during this arc than I was with the freak stuff. But, you know, like I said, in general, though, I didn't think it was horrible, horrible. I've got to say, as much as I'm a little bit annoyed that New York City seems to have about eight people in it, it does feel like they're keeping the continuity pretty tight. Like, there are some little things here. <laughs> there, like Jonah's stroke slash heart attack, I guess stroke stroke heart attack, if you will. You know, things like that that just seem odd, but overall it feels like we're in one singular continuity and it makes sense. And we're interacting less with the Marvel Universe here, so that I don't think really comes into play. We'll get into that a lot next time when we have some new Avengers action. And so I think with that storyline, we'll tackle the web shooter question, talk about that a little bit. Storyline after that is the one where Mary Jane comes back, and there we're going to ask that big question of Jason's about could we do these stories with Mary Jane? And I think it'll be interesting to start bringing that up as a topic. Thank you for listening, everyone. This is Michael T. Bradley. And this is Jason Freston saying thanks for listening. You've been listening to Spider-Man Dissembled.